and welcome to the DMing 202 Managing Player Types Seminar. My name is Sean Merwin, and I am the Seminar Coordinator for the Heralds Guild of DMs. We are a volunteer group who are trying to spread the joy of D&D and DMing. We create content for DMs and offer it for free at conventions and game days and online at the Heralds Guild website. The Heralds Guild is sponsored by Bald Man Games. Bald Man Games offers convention support to companies like Wizards of the Coast at large events like Gen Con. If you are playing organized play events like the D&D Adventurers League at large conventions, there is a good chance that Bald Man Games is involved. For this seminar, I would like to introduce Teos Abadia. Teos is a longtime contributor to D&D content and organized play campaigns and one of my favorite people in the D&D world. Teos is here to talk about the various types of players you might find at your D&D table, how to recognize the different types of players, and how to manage them. Hi folks, how's Gen Con? Woo! Good, all right. It's my favorite time of the year, my Christmas. Um, so what we're here to talk about is how we can create an environment that is engaging for players, regardless of what particular interest they have. And we want to do that by figuring out what kind of players we have at the table. Based on those interests that they have, we want to create the right experience for them, and also to break down individual silos of each player's preference into an experience that weaves them all together for the whole party. So the whole table has a great time. So that's why we're here today to talk about player types. So what are player types? Um, these are archetypes. Kind of what a sage would do to study this topic. Create an archetype of what a player motivation looks like, a common player motivation. What's the essence of what engages a player and makes them interested in a particular adventure, an encounter, a scene? Recognizing the kind of players we have at the table allows us to then tailor the experience for that player and the other players that are there. Important to recognize that players aren't just one type, and that all of this is a tool. It's a little bit of a, a, a you know, it's like a, a recognition mechanic that we have in our brains as DMs, rather than being a straitjacket. No one person is exactly this archetype. It's a tool by which we facilitate better play. So what's the history of this, and why are we talking about player types? Are we making this up? It is so important that it's been in the first 10 pages of DMGs for the last three editions, including this one. First 10 pages. Right. It was important enough for fourth edition that it's in the DMG 1 and the DMG 2. Uh, it starts back in 1984 when Glenn Blackow writes for this uh, magazine, Different Worlds, I'm sure we're all subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> and he writes role-playing style aspects of adventure game. This is a great read. If you look hard enough through the magic of Google, you will find it for free. Uh, although you can also pay for it. Uh, I'm not going to tell you which one I did. And uh, that's not recorded, right? And um, <laughs> we'll, he we'll talks talk about that. four different types. Uh, Role-playing, storytelling, power gaming, and war gaming, which he kind of means tactical analysis. And when he's doing this, he's really kind of funny. It's a little bit of grognard. And he's talking about not an individual player, but a table that shows up and wrecks your, what you plan as a DM. And how do they wreck it, right? They wreck it because they're role-playing so much they never leave the tavern. Never mind that they're having a great time. He doesn't focus on that. It's the fact that I had this module to run for you, and instead you stayed in the tavern and had a wonderful little time there. Or um, the power gamers that just, dude, where are the monsters? Get us to the, there's a cave? We're going to the cave. Yeah, no, no, yeah, cave, right? Where's the, do you have treasure? Maybe we're staying here. <laughs> we're going to kill the NPCs and take all the treasure, right? Keep on the Borderlands classic experience. Uh, and he talks about this from a convention perspective. So if you're a convention DM, this is a fantastic read as he takes this first cut at it. Later that same year, TSR does a study and they look at kind of what people like and they find, interestingly, a 22% equal distribution between story, tactics, actor, or power gamer as an express preference. But also they find 12% of people say, either I like a little bit of everything or I don't really care. It's not a factor for me. Um, even more interestingly, they find that all types of players report that they don't want just one thing. So maybe I identify as being a power gamer, but I like a cool story around it, right? It's kind of like my video game. I want that immersive environment while I'm beaten up on endless numbers of tunes. And so that's an important consideration, that players aren't just one thing. 
So in 2001, this really takes forward to the modern era where Robin Laws, and if you haven't read anything about Robin Laws, definitely do. Uh, Robin's Laws of Good Game Mastering, who first brings up, this up, is great. Uh, Hamlet's Hit Points is fantastic. He had great games like Gumshoe, so get into Robin Laws if you don't know him. Uh, he expands in this book the player types that Blackout created. And then in 2005, he does it for the third edition DMG2. That's also a really good read. He does it in a slightly different way. In 2008 and 9, he is again brought in to write the 4E DMG and DMG2, along with others. And he writes about it there. And then last year, the fifth edition Dungeon Master's Guide, if you look in there, it's expressed as preferences rather than individual player types. Um, but it is once again in that, in that material. Um, Robin is a consultant on the fifth edition Dungeon Master's Guide. So he probably either related to it or, you know, okayed it, or maybe he even wrote that part. Um, but it's also important to notice that when Wizards writes, they don't, it's not one guy that writes it and it's done. A lot of people look over it. So the appearing in three DMGs, uh, three editions worth of DMGs, four different books, shows you how important this topic has been to all of the folks at Wizards of the Coast. All right, so how do we identify player types? A uh, great way to do it is those player introductions, how they approach it, right? If you say that uh, you're an elf that used to be a dwarf and you're magically transformed, that already tells us a little something about this player's approach versus the one that says, I collect the head of every beast I slay. <laughs> right, that's all right. Player motivations are becoming clear. Um, what did this discuss with other players? You have the two people who are talking about, no, no, at this level, you want to take this thing. Right? You take this feat, and then you throw this power in. It's amazing. Right? You start figuring out what kind of player they are as you hear that discussion. Forgotten Realms lore. It's really important to understand that Mole Master used to be, oh, okay, right? Clue in on what, what kind of things interest the table. Uh, while we're doing play, a really good cue is what causes players to check out. You've probably all as a DM had that situation where you were engaging with a player, having this awesome NPC to character discussion, and that person's asleep. Or they're checking their phone, or they're like, I'm going to go, I'll be back. And they just wander off, right? Because interacting with an NPC at the merchant is just so not interesting to them. So figuring out on these cues allows you to then address it with the techniques we'll discuss later. Um, another thing that you can do, and the more you do this, it's hard in 5th edition to, to get the, this practice down. I think it takes a lot of cuts to figure out how as a DM you want to do this. But the more that you can find a way as a DM to track ideals, bonds, personalities, or flaws, at least some of that, will give you a clue as to the player type, will give you comfort points that'll help you draw in a player, right? Because it's something that resonates with them. Um, gives you an engagement mechanism with a reward because you can hand out inspiration, right? You get inspiration if you play to your flaw and I can help you play to your flaw because I know what it is and my adventure can cater to that. Um, so that sort of identification reward mechanic through ideals, bonds, and personalities and flaws is a great way to, to work with player types. All right, so uh, we will now talk about the first player type, the actor. Actor! Uh, the actor values the narrative over the mechanics. It's really important to see how the story interacts with me because I've so carefully created my persona as a character. Um, right now I'm role playing a guy giving a presentation. Um, <laughs> it's a perfect reward mechanism, I'll do it again. Um, so they tend to be in character. They emphasize their personality. Um, one of the clear things you'll hear them say, it's what my character would do. I know this is stupid, but what my character really believes is that I must do the following. Um, strong personal identification with the character. They know exactly what their character does, even when it's not what they favor as a person. At their best, what an actor does at your table is they inspire the table to role play more deeply, to create an immersion for other characters. Right? When this one person's totally getting into the scene, the other person tends to ratchet it up too, and that's great to see. So how do you engage the actor? We recognize them because of those, those different things they do. Um, we can feed off of their PC personality and backstory. And ideally, in a positive way. So I had the great DM. He's a uh, level six DM as well, Sean Molly, at our table. And one of our guys has an, is a warlock in his invisible closet. Not only did he recognize that that was cool, but he had an NPC who was important walk into the room, spot the closet, and instead of what a lot of DMs might do, which is to put it down, man, you got an evil creature serving you. He said, uh, all seven of you, and there's six at the table, are important to this mission. And you and your friend. Let's talk later about job opportunities, right? Like, what a way to elevate 
that player instead of putting them down and recognize that. So that's a great way of you know, engaging someone who has that kind of, uh, who's taken that approach with their character. NPCs interact, respond to PC qualities. Uh, in combat, vivid combat descriptions, right? So you're the bard who composes poems. Did you write that one about, uh, you know, you say that I bash into them, you know. I hated what you wrote, you know, I hated your song. Uh, it's always stuck in my head, right? Uh, it's in my head now. Um, include role play in combat, so challenge people, um, create some sort of feedback based on their PC qualities. And one thing that's important about the actor, the actor needs to remember that whatever their cool quirks are has to seed to the greater good. So I had long ago in Living Greyhawk a game where the cleric refused to go in because the dwarves were being stupid to the haunted minds full of undead. And we really suffered for that. And as a DM, you want to facilitate that it's cool that you have this. We've all recognized it. You still need to act like a, this is a game. We're all here as a community having fun. Second player type is the explorer. So we identify them because they seek to discover the settings, underground lore and secrets and underpinnings. Um, they want to know what's going on in the story, what's around that corner, what's in the box. A lot of discovery taking place for the explorer, and they want that experience to be rewarding. They get really let down if what they look in is uh, actually nothing there. It's an empty room, there's no backstory, that kind of thing. Uh, they respond to mood and tone, right? The flashes of lightning, the mist slowly rolling, rolling out across the dungeon floor. Uh, rich descriptions of things, uh, historical descriptions. You know, this has been in Mole Master for years, you can see this. Uh, this is from the Fan Enclave, those kinds of important pieces. They love exploring not just the story of it, but the maps, the terrain, um, in a sort of fourth edition style of play, moving across the map to see what triggers when you go around different places, what's around a corner, uh, what is that glowing area, right? Those kinds of things. They may take notes. Uh, at their best, an explorer helps bring the setting to life for other players, uh, encourages them to interact with it, and connects lore and encounters so that the adventure flows together, right? Because they, they find all these pieces and, and show you how the adventure fits together. So how do we engage the explorer? Um, biggest thing is that their exploration should matter, right? You don't want, they say, was this like an ancient burial chamber? I don't know. Why do I bother, right? Instead, <laughs> if it doesn't matter to the adventure, sure. You know, you see some signs that it could have been an ancient burial chamber. Oh, cool, I bet it's because blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's very plausible. You think that might be the case. <laughs> sure. Right? And then as you're thinking later on, you bring something else up about uh, they're wearing sacrificial burial robes. Sure, why not, right? Like your burial rites are written down in a notebook that's there on the side. It doesn't affect the adventure at all. Greatly pleases the explorer. Um, give them, celebrate their discoveries. So awesome, you figured out. Because of what you did, you figured the falling out. And then they get really excited that they, that they found that. Um, Provide space to investigate and plan even between the encounters. So give them just a quick you know, minute to think about what they want to do before they get to the cave with the goblins in it. Um, that can trigger actually a lot of really cool interaction with other players too, which is nice. Um, versus just saying, no, cut scene, we're going to the next thing. Hint when combat can be avoided or influenced, an explorer likes figuring that out. You know what? The dragon might be asleep. Remember how they said that one thing? All right, they love that. And then they all start planning and doing some cool thing. Uh, monsters can have descriptive differences. So something I like is, you know, an explorer type might say, like, you know, could we make the wolves work for us? Sure, right? Just figure it out on the fly. And yeah, you know, you, you see that he keeps mistreating the wolf at his side. And then the druid comes over and turns the wolf against the bad guy, and it's awesome. Uh, the explorer may need help when knowing when to stop exploring and move on. So they may just want to keep looking and looking and looking, and you need that little gentle nudge. Or uh, something like an a interaction or planning session. I know what you're looking for. Uh, here's what you find at the end of that. You spend an hour casing the town. Here's what you find out. We're moving on. Third player type is the instigator. They want to see the adventure respond to the things that they do. They seek thrills and risks. They're jumping over ledges. Um, they go into the other room while the other party's still fighting the first. They're unafraid of bad choices. They're impulsive. They look for stimulus. They're the kind of person when everybody's like, do you want to do A or B? And they're like, B, I run. Leroy Jenkins. Uh, <laughs> they create excitement at the table at their best. Surprises, a fast pace. Let's go, let's go, guys, to the airships now. That's awesome. Um, how do you engage them? You want to keep their actions to be significant but not derailing. And that takes a lot of practice with instigators because they are troublemakers. 
Um, instigators like to think are like the baby that drops food over the edge. They're not being bad, they just want to see what happens. Again and again and again. If you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you want to kill them, but they're good, they're good. No, my instigators are great, all these types are great. And actually I should ask, like how many folks see themselves in an, as an instigator when they play? Sean? <laughs> and you can be multiple types. How about an actor? And an explorer, all the lore, the notes. As long as you go through phases, like I was really an explorer in Living Greyhawk. I wanted to know how it all worked. All the campaign secrets had to be mine. Um, so then, uh, with the going back to the instigator, uh, highlight combat elements which is they can, they can interact. They love things like the semi rotten beam, right? Uh, the hayloft, and there's something that can cause fire. <laughs> Uh, I had a great adventure that Sean wrote yes. where there was a flaming hell inside of this room and everybody was making jump checks through fire rings and all kinds of craziness and they all loved it and it started with an instigator. Um, when other PCs need attention, the instigator has to be moved off camera and that's okay. So learning methods that you can do that to kind of say like, yeah, yeah, you're totally doing that. I'll get back to what the results of that. Now let's move to you and the thing you were asking me about. Right, so the instigator is just kind of put over here. Things are happening, but it's minimized windows. Right? Like, it's over there. Um, they can sometimes put their desires where the party wish. This is the thing, you know, I start a bar fight. No one else in the party wants a bar fight. And they're like, I take a swing. And my rule of thumb with instigators in these situations is always give them, give the other party the ability to stop that action. Right? So you guys see he's about to throw a punch. What kind of things would you like to do? And it's just like time's frozen, right? You just go to like, and they can do all kinds of things to influence that player. And you want to kind of, and if it still really needs to happen, right? And the hit has to connect because that guy's not willing to pull the punch, then find another way to get back to what the rest of the party wants, right? So this huge melee breaks out in the tavern. We're not going to work this out in combat. All of a sudden, someone underneath the table says, Psst, hey, over here. And that NPC takes everybody out of the bar fight, which rages on and was awesome. And if that player wants to stay there and like their character just is in a raging bar fight for an hour, cool. All right, you did that. But the rest of the party went over here and found all the plot hooks. Okay. Um, fourth type is the power gamer. Who's a power gamer? A little bit of a power gamer sometimes. <laughs> Um, values capability and mastery over the game elements, right? How things interact to make really super awesome sauce. They are motivated by accumulating power and wealth, a magic item, right? Oh, yeah, that's a magic item. How does that work with that feat that I'm thinking about in the future? They can enjoy heavy optimization. Sometimes they can like breaking the game a bit, seeing how everything just, you know, no monster can move without taking 4,000 points of damage, and they must all move. <laughs> uh, they know the rules very well, and they can tell you all about how the game actually works. You were wrong. Uh, but they can be a key part of victory. They can inspire new players and new <coughs> players in the game. I had my nine-year-old at a convention two weeks ago, and every time he saw the power gamer do cool stuff, he's like, I might want to make that character. <laughs> right? That's really positive for the hobby, that kind of thing. Um, how do you engage the power gamer? You want to recognize their mastery. It is awesome. It does take work. They, they lost sleep over how cool the character is. And you want to recognize that. Uh, help them see non-combat non scenes as exciting and as worthy of challenge as a combat scene. Um, highlight the challenges, right? Only the most skilled merchants could negotiate this, can you? That cliff looks almost unclimbable, but you're pretty strong. Right? Get, keep giving that same sort of feeling out of the rest of the game. Um, and reward them with praise and results when they choose to actually be suboptimal, when they embrace a character flaw, uh, those kinds of things. Um, on rules, you know, I usually tend to go with what another player says. I'm fine with it, and I'll look it up later. I don't mind being, that if we're both wrong, cool, as long as you're happy. Uh, if I really think the player's wrong, then I'll just say, you know, in the interest of time, I'm going to rule it this way. And we're going to move on. I, I don't want to look something up. No, we're good. Right? Keep it fun. Um, sometimes when you have a very big disparity in power, you can direct them towards a single foe. This is the obvious challenge. You could play this, and you can, if you want, if, you, if it's your approach, you can escalate them, make them harder. So that they have their own little miniature super cool combat over here, and everybody else is having an equally important combat in the rest of the room. Um, you can give other players a different type of challenge, like turning off the traps is super important, right? Um, the minions will overwhelm them if you can't stop them even if he's got the big bad guy or she's got the big bad guy. 
If they are disruptive, encourage them to role play as leaders and sort of take everybody under their wing rather than being an island unto themselves. At their worst, a power gamer can overshadow others, push others around for treasure options, uh, and behave like everybody is their entourage. Um, so work on them being a team player and showing restraint. Um, um, it, you know, I should talk a little bit more about breaking down silos. Uh, so like for a power gamer, for example, um, weaving that into an instigator. And um, one thing that you can do is create an experience for one player that brings in another. So for example, the brass, brash action of an instigator can create a challenge, uh, like say going into a second room, right? That requires the power gamer to go stop that room from coming in. Right? You need to hold the door. Create that kind of situation. So one brash action requires the power gamer to resolve. That's a good example of it. Uh, if I go a little back a little further, instigator um, and uh, or an explorer and an actor, we can look at something like what someone finds out when they are exploring is personal to another player at the table. That's a good example of breaking down those individual, individual silos, appeal to both at the same time. Um, so let's go to player type five, which is the slayer. The slayer loves to chuck dice and slay monsters. Sometimes casual players can be a lot like slayers, but some people really just love the supremacy, right? So it's the kind of person that plays a battle active and says it was super easy, there was no challenge at all, and it was awesome. Right? We killed the guy in, a, in one round, and it was awesome. Just fantastic. Uh, victory, supremacy, a fight one is better than other options usually, uh, though rolling a lot of dice for other things can be good too. They bring excitement to the game, they keep it quick, uh, and they relish the combat, they bring people, the rest of the party forward in action. We engage slayers by making foes seem important even when they're not. Yeah, you took down another minion, that's awesome, he you know, crumbles under your hammer. Right? Make it really seem epic every time they're taking over the smallest little guy. Um, personally challenge the party or uh, the PC so that the victory is sweeter for the slayer. And have lots of hordes accumulate around that particular horde slayer uh, so that they feel great as more and more foes fall. When it's not combat, you can try to sort of visualize and help them visualize skill kills, where like if you're taking down a trap, that every success feels like a victory, like another foe has fallen, right? Another skill has succeeded. You're almost there, you're climbing up the mountain, you, you've got to do one more thing, there's this handle up there, can you grab it? And they're like, yeah, another victory climbing the mountain. Um, Slayers, you've got to keep an eye on how they may want to rush through the story. They may just be, whatever, we don't want to talk to that guy. But everybody else does. Right? Keep them engaged, help them respect what others want out of the play experience. The storyteller is another uh, player type. Um, and they tend to emphasize the story that's not just the narrative interaction with the characters, but actually the story itself, the plot as you would read a novel. right? They want to see choices have an impact, but because it's part of this greater story taking place above them. They like it when the plot threads weave together. They want to see the foe's story revealed, understand the underpinnings of what was going on, right? What was really taking place in Mole Master? What was Elemental Evil doing? Those kinds of things. Why is there something going on in the Underdark, right? They want to slowly figure that out and have it be rich and feel like the next chapter in a novel. Many DMs are storytellers. Uh, and they can help other players remember why their choices and actions matter, because it's part of this bigger thing unfolding. We want to change Mole Master. We want to help the Flan refugees. We engage the storyteller by giving relevance to the encounters and showing how things all link together, making sure that it's clear that how the narrative is unfolding of the overall campaign. Right? Um, that can require some work on our end. We need to understand how our adventure that we're running fits into a larger plot and then make sure that the storyteller hears that. Relate the history behind things, um, do your legwork on the part of Forgotten Realms you're in, or whatever other setting you're running. Explain, explain NPC and foe motivations, right? So if, these, if the players can't figure out why these guys are fighting you, make that clear, right? The storyteller really needs that, if not every player. Um, tie, see the P, tie the PC's backstory into the narrative development so they can see how the story relates to them, right? Uh, you're a pirate. Um, these people are like pirates in that they are a nefarious merchant guild, and there is some commonality there. In fact, they used to ply the seas, right? And that gives you more, more richness and all seems to make sense and come together. Ah, yes, I'm part of this. Add depth so you can name monsters or NPCs when they don't have names. Give them a history, a 
fame, a role in the larger plot. Because a lot of times doing that won't change the adventure in one bit, but makes it a much deeper experience and seems like what you're doing is part of this awesome, well thought things. TV shows do all this time, right? Do this all the time. If you watch a, a good TV show that has these sort of episodic serial things, but links into previous chapters and just tiny, you know, one sentence pieces can link things together. Uh, the storyteller may do things because it's where they think the story should go. A uh, common example in Adventure League play might be, it's what the faction would do, it's what the Zentarum would do. Even though we probably should do something else, the adventure is pointing in a certain way, or I should do something else, they feel like this must be the way to do it. And they can sometimes be obstinate about that, frustrated with other players who want to act contrary to the story, um, or if the adventure itself doesn't make sense, if they can't figure out why things are taking place, and then it's important to help in and smooth over those edges. Um, kind of back on breaking silos a bit. When uh, you're looking at a storyteller and a slayer, the slayer's success can be integral to the story if it uncovers a story element, right? So you take down all these foes and one of the guys is falling says, uh, you know, no, I was hoping to, and reveals a part of the plan, right? Weaves it together. And so there's multiple kills that the slayer was accumulating trigger a narrative piece, a story piece. Seventh player type is the thinker. They see adventure as a puzzle to be solved. An analytical man mindset needs to be applied to the adventure so that we can achieve victory. They enjoy complex, realistic problems, right? So they can apply the logic that's in their brains. They look for efficiency. They want to see decisions gain the upper hand. Because I did this, then we got an edge on the battle, right? The goblins were in the cave, but we smoked them out. That was really clever of us. Uh, they enjoy consistent rules because otherwise, how do you make decisions if the world works randomly at every table? Many DMs are thinkers. They want to create this cool situation that players go through, and when they do this, then this will happen. It's all very logical. Uh, at their best, what thinkers do is they bring a level of tactics to the game that otherwise wouldn't be there. You know, let's plan for this. Let's come up with a neat idea. And then when plans go up in smoke, that's pretty fun, too. Um, Thinkers see choice as important, and that can be really good for players to think, yeah, when I do something, it matters, right? If I fly or if I jump over here, that has a, a big edge on the combat. We engage thinkers by acknowledging that they're being perceptive about this and react to them, give them rewards for their cool strategies. Um, if they want to smoke the goblins out of the cave, having it not work is really disappointing, right? And so the more that we can encourage those kinds of reactions and figure it out and adjust the difficulty as needed so it's still a cool combat, that's great. Um, give them cho choices and highlight uh, the different options. So if they're missing things, that there's an actual choice and you see that you have a thinker at the table, you want to go back and say, well, just to be clear, you guys could also do this. And I think you were talking about that originally. Let's go, you know, you do have these two options. And then they re-engage and go, oh yeah. Uh, and that's a good, you know, that kind of example of where two people are checking out and then you say, hey, while these guys are talking, you two realize based on their conversation here's some choices that your party is going to face next you guys can think about that while we finish here um hint at monster traits uh, tactics and motivations right this guy uh has a weak leg um this guy tends to go for casters right um, those kinds of things can create a tactical sense even when there may not really be one uh, map sketch if theater of the mind isn't insufficient so they might like just a quick sketch of what the room looks like so they can plan and scheme. Uh, the thinker, you have to be careful, they may correct other characters. No, no, no. What your bard should be doing is boosting that character. You gotta be careful of that. They start running other people. Uh, they may over plan, you know, let, 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 maybe we wanna do this instead. Help, so you wanna help them through those things. Um, they may also dislike when the DM is arbitrary and just kinda goes, you know, this is what happens. They want a real logical progression, and sometimes that's unavoidable. Our last player type is the watcher. Uh, the Watcher loves kind of just enjoying the game like it's a TV show or a movie, right? They, it's a casual social event. They want to see what happens at an impersonal level. This is cool to witness. I don't have to be super involved with it. They may be an introvert by nature. They may just be a passive observer. They're less active. They don't want the spotlight. So if you kind of say, what do you do? I'm good. Um, they can help keep other players grounded. You know, we've got all these other types at the table. Having one or two <laughs> watchers can be really nice. It balances out the group. Uh, they can be facilitators and mediators. You know, why don't we just go with that plan? 
cool. Now we've got a direction. Um, many new players start as a watcher and then turn into something else. They get more comfort. We engage watchers by keeping the, direct, the involvement direct, short, and sweet. You don't want to over-engage the watcher because then that's overwhelming and too much. But just come real quick, hey, what, you know, what do you want to do about this thing? And then you move on. Right? Uh, what's your vote in this? Give solid cues when involvement is critical. Say they know I really need a decision. I should step forward and give one, and then I can retreat into the background space. Um, embellish encounters to make them a little more interesting and engaging, if only for them to witness that. You don't have to participate. You can give them simple but engaging roles. Uh, you're on a ship, and we need someone to do the rigging. Is that something your character wants to do? Cool, they're off doing that. And they can see it in their mind. They don't need to roll a ton of dice or role play it. They're off there on the rigging having a great time. Lay bait, but let them choose whether they want to bite on it or not. Same kind of thing. Don't overwhelm them. Uh, other players may try to cut them off. Try to prevent that. Give them a little bit of space so they can make that decision at their pace. They may react negatively if they're forced to act because it's not what they want out of the game. Um, they may want to multitask, be on their phone, and be a part of the adventure. Sometimes you got to allow for that. It's just the way it want, they want to be. Uh, and don't let them distract others. I'm on the phone, and this is an amazing YouTube video. You all have to see because I forget that this is actually something that requires participation to happen. And you guys usually do that for me. Thanks so much. Um, so let's go back a little bit and say, uh, how many folks here are uh, slayers that like to see lots of foes fall beneath their feet? They tend to be that way in a battle, in right? Lots of victory. Yeah. Uh, storytellers who like to see all those. Yeah, yeah. And how about thinkers, tactical analysis? Yeah, it can be really sweet. How about watchers? <coughs> My wife is most certainly a watcher. Um, Go back and talk about other presentations. If you've seen uh, some of the presentations that we've given as part of the Adventurers Guild earlier, uh, DM 101 talks about table management, how to present the situation and determine the outcome. And it has two things that it talks about what the players perceive, look at what they see, and then we look at what the player is trying to accomplish. So what the players perceive, we can tie to what engages players, right? So if I'm trying to describe what your character sees, and I know that you're interested in these various things based on your bonds, ideals, what you told me about your backstory, then I can link directly to that. Um, and in that presentation where it talks about what our player is trying to accomplish, that motivation of the player, uh, if you collect all the heads of your enemies, that's the kind of thing that's going to really give a rewarding system to them if we take that into account. DM 102 talks about storytelling. And it looks at how to manage characters' interaction with settings, NPCs, and other PCs. That we can obviously leverage player type there so that they have a really good time. And we can guide the actions of these NPCs and story elements so that the different player types are benefiting. Some other considerations that I think you know, aren't player types necessarily, but figure into the different kinds of people that come to your tables. Bathroom breaks are really important for many. It gives a mental pause. Um, watchers can appreciate it, others as well, where you just, you know, after encounter two is usually where I like to look at, maybe there should be a little break, you know, if anyone needs a break, all right, let's take a, a little moment. Um, some people have trouble with theater of the mind. I like it a lot, but some people just really cannot visualize it, and that's important to recognize, and then give them a quick sketch, give them some cues, uh, explain who's near them again. Um, people who are uncomfortable with role play. You'll meet those folks, and if you're trying to always engage them in character, they really don't like it, and then it can be a negative part of the experience for them. Familiar, familiarize yourself with disabilities. If you DM long enough, uh, I've had several blind players. I've had awesome blind DMs. Uh, I've had deaf players. That's a hard one because you've got to look right at them so they can read your lips. You start talking to another character, and that NPC is suddenly not speaking. Right? Uh, Asperger's, um, right, where uh, you don't reach over and touch them. Um, I'll give them a hug in character, really bad. Um, do not, and I'm not making light of it, but these are things that are worth reading up on if you're going to DM enough to know what happens, right? The person that just can't hold back and always cuts everybody off. Oh, they're going to make a check. I'll make that check too. I'm rolling right now. I rolled first. I got a 27, right? So you got to help like, I'm going to get to your roll in just one second. I think they started first. I know what you're trying to do. Let me see. Okay, they succeed. So you both find the following, right? And everybody, everybody else gets it. Um, so those are important things to read up on because they, all these folks deserve to play too and deserve to have a great experience. 
Uh, one that happens all the time, it happens a lot at uh, conventions like PAX, supportive friend or spouse who wants limited engagement. I'm here because they want me to be. And that's super critical. If you want this person, right, if you want her to be able to play all the time like she wants to, you got to keep the husband happy just enough, but not force them into participating so deeply that they have a terrible experience, right? You got the primary one, give them what they want, keep them just involved enough. New players who are figuring out preferences, let them, let them develop that preference. Uh, disruptive behavior, language, smoking, I don't like, you know, whether it's electronic or not, any sort of smoking, I remove that from the table because it's going to disrupt at least me, if not someone else. Uh, excessive use of electronics. Right? Um, those are things to consider and adjust to, just like player types. So we'll wrap up here. Um, the takeaways from this presentation, there are a lot of different player types involved with the people who play D&D. And there's no right way to play. It's not that a storyteller is better than a power gamer or the other way around. Um, knowing how that these player types exist and thinking of them as archetypes can be a useful tool so you can analyze the people at your table, get a feel for the kind of situations you want to create and play, and weave them in so that they benefit each other. Right? You break down those silos. The more that we develop these engagement techniques that give rewards for their, what they like out of the game, the more we're better DMs and we create a better experience at the table. More people are participating, they're not falling asleep, they're not leaving the table. They're collaborating regardless of what the individual's like as a preference. Um, and that is the end of the presentation. Any questions, folks?